Hello, I'm Professor Brian Boucher, and welcome back. In this video, we're going to build on our discussion of the balance sheet equation to talk about assets, liabilities, and stockholders' equity in more detail, focusing on when we can record them and when we can't record them. I hope you enjoy the video. An asset is a resource that's expected to provide future economic benefits. That means it's either going to generate cash in the future or it's going to reduce the amount of cash we have to pay in the future. There's two criteria that we're going to use to decide when we can recognize an asset. It has to be acquired in a past transaction or exchange, and the value of its future benefits can be measured with a reasonable degree of precision. So for example, if we buy a truck, we acquire that truck in a transaction, the value of its future benefits are probably reflected in what we paid for the truck, both criteria are satisfied, a truck is an asset. Or let's say we make a sale to a customer and they promise to pay us within 30 days. This would be an asset called accounts receivable because it was acquired in an exchange, we gave up some goods to get that promise to pay, and the value of its future benefits can be measured because it's right there on the invoice. Now let's practice applying these criteria to figure out which of the following are assets. I will give you a number of items and for each one, I want you to try to figure out if it's an asset or not. If it is an asset, try to give me the account name we would use for it and the dollar amount. If it's not an asset, then try to figure out which criteria would cause it to not be an asset. I will put up the pause sign if you want to pause and try to answer it yourself. Otherwise, you can roll through, hear the answers, and then try this out on the homework. Let's get started. BOC sells $100,000 of merchandise to a customer that promises to pay cash within 60 days. This one will be an asset. We acquired this asset through a transaction delivering goods to a customer. We can measure the value of the future benefits because it's how much cash the customer owes us according to the invoice that we presumably gave them. This asset is called accounts receivable. Anytime customers owe us money based on delivering them goods, we're going to call that asset accounts receivable. And the value is going to be $100,000, which is how much the customer owes us. BOC signs our contract to deliver $100,000 of natural gas to DEF each month for the next year. This one will not be an asset because there's been no past transaction or exchange. Every exchange of cash, goods, or services is going to happen sometime in the future. Nothing has been exchanged now, and so there can't be an asset for this. Excuse me. Both of these two sound like promises to me. Why is the first one an asset but the second one is not? That's a great question. In the first case, the customer promises to pay us, but we've delivered goods. So we have a pretty strong claim on either getting the goods back or getting the $100,000. So that transaction exchange makes it a clear economic benefit or resource, asset. In the second case, all we've done is sign a contract. If the contract were broken, it's not clear that we have any basis to ask for that $100,000. So it's less likely that this is a resource and it's less likely that it's an asset. Now having said that, there are some situations where this second case where we signed a contract could be an asset under mark-to-market -market accounting, but that's something we'll talk about much later in the course. BOC buys $100,000 of chemicals to be used as raw materials with payment made in time to secure a 2% discount on the purchase price. This will be an asset because we acquired the chemicals in a market transaction. We'll call this asset inventory Inventory is the term that we use for any product that we intend to sell at a higher price. And because these chemicals are raw materials to a product we make, it'll be part of inventory. The value of the future benefits are also known here because it's what we paid in the market transaction. But it's not the $100,000, it's the $98,000 that we actually paid that we use for the value of the asset. BOC pays $12 million for the annual rent on its office building. It has already occupied it for one month.
This is an asset because in a market transaction we paid for the right to occupy space in this office building. We're going to call that asset prepaid rent. The value of the benefits are also known. Uh, they're 11 million here, not 12 million. Even though we've paid 12 million dollars cash, we've occupied the space for a month, so we've used up one month of that. There's 11 months of future space that we're entitled to. The value of that 11 months is 11 million dollars, so that's the value we use for the asset. BOC buys a piece of land for 100 thousand dollars. Its broker says this was a steal because the land is probably worth $150,000. This is an asset because we acquired the land in a market transaction. We will call the asset land. The value of the benefits are assumed to be $100,000, which is what we paid for the land. It's not the $120,000, which the broker says it's worth because that wasn't based on a market transaction. We assume the value of the benefits are what we actually paid for the land to acquire it. BOC is advised by a marketing firm that its brand name is worth $63 million. This one would not be an asset because it was not acquired in a past transaction or exchange, and you could argue that the value of the brand is not measured with a reasonable degree of precision. Are you saying that marketing people do not know what they are talking about? No, no, no. I, I definitely respect marketing people. In fact, some of my best friends are marketing professors. It's simply a case where accounting tends to err on the side of reliability or objectivity. Without that market transaction where we can be really sure that we've acquired this resource, that we know how much it's worth, we err on the side of leaving it off, the asset side. As a result, the value of a company on its financial statements is often far below the market value of the company determined by investors, because investors could call this brand name an asset, whereas the accounting system's not going to do it. Now we're gonna to turn to liabilities. A liability is a claim on assets by creditors, non-owners, that represent an obligation to make future payment of cash, goods, or services. My former boss called me a liability to the organization. Is this what he meant? No, you were probably a liability in a different sense. Let me go on. Like in the case of assets, there are two criteria that have to be satisfied to recognize a liability. First, the obligation is based on benefits or services received currently or in the past, and the amount and timing of payment is reasonably certain. So an example of how this would work in practice is if we borrowed money from a bank, then we have an obligation to repay the bank. That obligation is based on the benefit of receiving the use of the money from the bank, satisfies the first criteria. The amount and timing of repayment of the loan is reasonably certain. If there was any question about it, the bank would surely let us know how much we owe them. So borrowing money from a bank would be a liability. It would be something like notes payable or mortgages payable. So what we're going to do next is the same exercise about which of the following are liabilities. It's the same exercise as before where there'll be a question, you'll hit the pause button or not, and then I'll come back with the answer. The OC receives $300,000 of raw materials from its supplier and promises to pay within 60 days. This would be a liability. We received raw materials from a supplier, got the benefit of the raw materials, creating an obligation to pay them $300,000, which is on the invoice. We're gonna call this liability accounts payable. We always use that term when we owe money to suppliers, and then the amount is $300,000. Based on this quarter's operations, the OC estimates that it owes the IRS $3 million in taxes. This is a liability, even though it's hard to see where the prior transaction was to that created the obligation. But essentially what happened is the government allowed us to operate our business, and in return, we're obligated to pay them taxes. So here the obligation comes from the transaction, quote unquote, that the government allowed us to operate. 
We estimate that we owe them $3 million in taxes, so that's our reasonably certain number. So we book a liability called income tax payable for $3 million. You said that the amount and timing of payment has to be reasonably certain for there to be a liability. Why is an estimated amount considered to be reasonably certain? We're going to have to use estimates a lot in accounting. As long as we're reasonably certain about the estimate, we can go ahead and book the liability. For something like taxes, the forms are available on the web. We know how we performed this month in terms of our income, so we can actually reasonably estimate how much we owe in taxes. And so it does make sense to book the liability even if we're not 100% certain what the final tax bill will be. The OC signs a three-year, $120 million contract to hire Aldox as its new CEO starting next month. This would not be a liability because there's no obligation based on benefits that have been received currently or in the past, which is the first criteria needed to book a liability. Until Al Dokes actually works for us and works for us without getting paid, there cannot be a liability. And then the liability would only be for the time he's worked without pay. We don't book a liability for the entire three-year contract because it's too uncertain. He could quit tomorrow, we could fire him tomorrow, lawyers could find ways to get out of this contract. The liability only appears once there's an obligation based on benefits received from him working for us. He hasn't worked yet, so there can't be a liability. The OC has not yet paid employees who earn salaries of $1 million during the most recent pay period. This one would be a liability. There's an obligation based on benefits we've received. The employees have work for us, so we've got the benefit of their services. The amount we owe them is reasonably certain. Uh, if we had any, concern, any questions about it, the employees would surely let us know how much we owe them. So there's an obligation based on past benefits. We know the amount. We need a liability. We'd call this salaries payable, and the amount would be $1 million. In both of these last two examples, we have not yet paid our employees. Why is this one a liability, but not the previous one? Is it because the first one pertains to an executive, whilst this one pertains to lowly employees? No, it has nothing to do with status. It's simply a matter that for a liability to exist, we, there must be an obligation based on benefits we've already received. Employees who have worked for us without being paid create a liability. An employee who has not yet worked for us cannot create a liability. The OC borrows $500,000 from a bank on a one-year note with a 10% interest rate. We used this example earlier. This is definitely a liability. The obligation is created because we got the benefit of the $500,000 from the bank. So that's the prior transaction. We got the $500,000 from the bank. The amount of payment is reasonably certain. The bank will tell us exactly how much we have to pay them back. And so we call this liability notes payable and record it for the $500,000 we borrowed. What about the interest? We will owe interest on the loan. Shouldn't there be an interest payable as well? Great question. Interest is not a liability at this point because we just got the loan and presumably we could pay it back immediately without having any interest. Interest only becomes a liability when the money is outstanding over time because then there's an obligation based on the benefit of having the money outstanding over time and to the extent that we haven't paid that yet, we have a liability to then pay that interest but only the interest for the time that's passed so far. The OC is sued by a group of customers who claim their products were defective. The suit claims damages of $6 million. This would not be a liability. Even though the obligation is created by the benefit we got from selling the products, we can claim that the amount of the payment is still uncertain. It's not reasonably certain. The suit claims damages of $6 million, but 
who knows how much we'll actually have to pay, if anything. So because there's uncertainty, we don't have to record a liability in this case. Finally, we have stockholders' equity. Stockholders' equity is the residual claim on assets after settling any of the claims on creditors. In other words, it's assets minus liabilities. This term probably has the most synonyms of anything in accounting. It's also called shareholders' equity or owner's equity or net worth or net assets or net book value. Now, there are not two criteria like with assets and liabilities because if you measure the assets correctly and the liabilities correctly, stockholders' equity is what's left over. But there are two sources of stockholders' equity. First, it can come from contributed capital. That's when we sell shares to the public. And there we'll have common stock at the par value, additional paid in capital at the excess over par value, and treasury stock, which is any stock that's repurchased by the company. Wait, what is this thing called par value? Is this why there are so many accountants on the golf course during the day? I'm not sure why you're seeing so many accountants at the golf course, but it has nothing to do with par value. Par value is this archaic historical concept. There used to be laws which said you had to set par value for a stock as the minimum price below which you could not issue new equity to the market. Most of those laws are gone. Nowadays, par value is just an arbitrary number. And the only implication is that when we account for stock issuances, we put the par value in common stock. We put the rest of the proceeds in additional paid in capital. You'll see more of this next video. The other source of stockholders' equity is retained earnings, which arises from operating the business. This is the accumulation of net income, revenues minus expenses, less any dividends since the start of the business. And again, as we had talked about in prior videos, retained earnings at the beginning of the year plus the net income minus dividends equals retained earnings at the end of the year. So what are dividends? These are distributions of retained earnings to shareholders. They're not an expense, and they're recorded as a reduction of retained earnings on the date that the board declares the dividend. Now, if you don't pay it in cash that date, you create a liability to pay the shareholders until the payment date and when you actually send the checks. Excuse me, please explain that again. Why are dividends not an expense? They are paid in cash like other expenses. Why are they a liability? Both great questions. Dividends are not viewed as an expense because they're not viewed as a cost of running the business. They're viewed as a discretionary decision by the board of directors to decide to return some funds to shareholders that is independent of what's going on with the business. Now, you could argue with this assumption, but it's the way we've always done it, which is the same explanation I'm going to give you for why dividends payable is a liability. The logic is once the board declares a dividend, until it's paid in cash, the, the company is essentially holding the shareholders money, making them creditors, and so we recognize the dividends payable. But it is strange that liabilities usually are to non-owners, or to creditors, to non-owners, whereas this is paid out to owners. So I guess my advice is just memorize these. Dividends are not an expense. And when dividends are declared but not paid, we create a dividends payable. And finally, there's the statement of stockholders' equity, which reports changes in stockholders' equity over a period of time. And that wraps up our look at assets, liabilities, and stockholders' equity. In the next video, we'll talk about how to keep track of them using those magical things called debits and credits. I'll see you then. See you next video.